The University of Melbourne Department of Rural Health is thrilled to bring you a webinar by Dr. Jackie Francis, also a resident of the Golden Valley. Jackie is a wellbeing lecturer, researcher, advisor, and educational designer at the University of Melbourne who focuses on wellbeing. She's undertaken a range of projects with communities, including co creating and piloting brief online wellbeing interventions for primary students creating wellbeing literacy programs for the staff of not-for-profit psycho psychosocial support organisations, uh, working with Richmond Fellowship Queensland and Darling Downs First Nations community to co-create the culturally adapted wellbeing literacy program, and also collaboratively producing the most recent recommendations for the New South Wales Department of Education wellbeing framework. So with the emergence of wellbeing science, including positive psychology, there's increasing evidence of what leads to well-being, economically, socially, and psychologically. So we hope this will be a cameras on interactive lecture designed to connect, collectively share conceptualizations and experiences of well-being from a scientific perspective and from the perspective of Golden Valley community members. So please welcome Dr. Jackie Francis to talk on It Takes a Village, Preparing Young People and the Community for Wellbeing. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a lovely introduction. So here we are, our, our lecture on preparing young people and the community for wellbeing. Uh, I would also like to just start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners on whose land we're located here in the Shepparton region, uh, the land of the Yorta Yorta people. I also wish to acknowledge the land on which the Centre for Wellbeing Science is located on the land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who contribute to the life of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education as well. So, as you know, my name is Jackie Francis. I'm from the Centre for Wellbeing Science, which is part of the Faculty of Education at the University of Melbourne. I think it's always good to know a little bit about who it is you're hearing from. So, uh, as part of this uh, lecture, I've consciously designed this time for us to be together, not just learning about wellbeing, but hopefully a little bit for our wellbeing and an opportunity to possibly nurture our wellbeing during this time together. So in doing so, sharing a little bit about me, perhaps also I'll learn a little bit about you. We can get to know each other a little bit as we begin. So here I've put together a small photo collage that shows you a little bit about who I am. As mentioned, I'm a lecturer from the Centre of Wellbeing Science uh, at the University of Melbourne. So that means I teach the science of wellbeing to undergraduate students from across the university and to postgraduate students who are enrolled in the Master of Applied Positive Psychology course. I also research wellbeing science, write about it and apply it out in the world through engagement projects with different organisations uh, and as mentioned, some of my recent work includes advising the New South Wales Department of Education on their wellbeing framework refresh for schools and also working with Richmond Fellowship Queensland, collaboratively designing with their First Nations team the wellbeing literacy program. Uh, so the picture in the bottom right here is a picture of me this July presenting at the IPA World Congress in Positive Psychology in Vancouver, presenting on this work that I've done with Richmond Fellowship Queensland. You can also see some other images that tell you a little something about me. I'm the mother to three sons, two adult sons and one 16-year-old. One of those sons is a ballet dancer in Europe. One is a uh, one is a student at ANU in Canberra, and one is a high school student and enthusiastic footballer here in Shepparton. I also have entered the time of life when caring for children sits alongside caring for aging parents. So in the top right hand corner there, you can see my very independent and capable mum. Uh, and then in the bottom left. There's a picture of me and two friends finishing the Mornington Peninsula 45 kilometre coast trek in May. 
I've always loved being active, loved the outdoors and loved spending time with friends. And the Coast Trek provides an opportunity to bring these loves together. And I might refer to that, uh, that experience as we move through the lecture or two, also just to illustrate some of the points that I talk about. Uh, so I think on that note, I'd love it if you would be able to kindly share by adding a word or two about who you are into the chat. We'll be able to see it here uh, behind, the, behind the screens. If you're able to just introduce yourself and let me know a little bit about who you are, perhaps what's meaningful or, or important in your life, uh, something that would something that lights you up. I'd love to see a little bit about who I'm talking to tonight. So please, I'll give you a moment to add that into, into the chat. So today I'll first introduce you to positive psychology and wellbeing science, including differentiating wellbeing from mental illness. Uh, we'll talk about wellbeing in relation to community groups such as schools, families, workplaces and sports clubs. I'll introduce you to wellbeing literacy as a key enabler for wellbeing. Uh, and I'll provide a couple of examples of community wellbeing in action. And finally, we'll wrap up with some time to reflect and talk and answer any questions that you may have as best we can in the time that we have. All right, so let's talk about positive psychology and wellbeing. Uh, since World War II, psychology primarily focused on deficit and dysfunction and how to repair what is damaged uh, or broken for very good reason with people returning from the trauma of war. Positive psychology, in contrast, is concerned with flourishing and emerged as an academic field a couple of decades ago to complement and balance traditional psychology. Positive psychology focuses on protecting and nurturing well-being and flourishing. Importantly, positive psychology is not just concerned with individuals, but organisations and the systems around them that enable flourishing. The positive psychology movement has been a valuable kickstart uh, to help understand the importance of well-being. So what exactly is well-being? Well-being is a word that means different things to different people, but what most people agree on is that it is multidimensional. Broadly speaking, we can think of well-being as feeling good, functioning well and doing good. These ideas of feeling good, functioning well and doing good can be explained using different models or frameworks of well-being that illustrate the multimodal nature of well-being. For instance, we can think about our emotional, social, cognitive, physiological, economic or spiritual well-being. So let me ask you, how do you define well-being? And that will take us to a Padlet where I'm asking you just to define what you think is well-being. And there's no wrong answers here. It's just an interesting um, exercise to find what our, our different conceptualizations and understanding of what well-being is. And we can just watch uh, and see what people contribute there. Pat Cummins' work, quality of life, personal well-being index, great. Feeling good and looking after my physical and mental health. Wellbeing is having the social, emotional, economical and cultural context to thrive. Self-care. Thanks so much. This is looking great. Wellbeing, having the coping resources to thrive in general life. Feeling well, happy and healthy. Fantastic. The physical and emotional literacy to thrive, optimism and positive self worth. So, there's how we're thinking about ourselves. That's great. So, we've got some themes coming through there of having that sense that well being in our physical selves, our well being in our mental, in our mental health, feeling happy, holistic concepts of what well being is. Fantastic. Feel free to keep adding to that if you would like to. So I'd like to share with you now that we've talked about our different conceptualizations of well-being, a couple of models of well-being as well. 
So this is a model of well-being that's probably one of the most extensively used models in the field of psychology. It holds true across the lifespan and across contexts, including in different cultural contexts around the world. It's extensively supported in research and practice. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is that when you have a theory that is supported by research and demonstrated in practice, it provides a guide or a signpost by which to identify well-being and plan for well-being in your life. So this is an image of self-determination theory. Self-determined uh, determination proposes that everybody has basic psychological needs. Uh, and that we seek to have these fulfilled and that fulfill, fulfilling these needs helps us to lead flourishing lives. The basic needs are competence, autonomy and relatedness. Competence refers to our need to be recognised for our competence and to grow in competence in things that are important to us. Autonomy refers to our need to have choice and volition in our lives, to make choices that our values aligned for ourselves and relatedness refers to our need for human connection we all need connection high quality connections support our well-being so self-determination theory provides a theory of quality motivation relevant to work school and sport as well and self-determination theory underpins successful workplace successful workplaces and workplace practices, such as, for example, autonomy, supportive leadership, which is associated with higher employee wellbeing and performance. Now, a way to remember these three elements is using the acronym CAR, C-A-R, C for competence, A for autonomy, R for relatedness. Someone shared this with me years ago when I first came across this theory. I love this theory. I use it in a lot of my work, in a lot of the uh, work we do with organisations that underpins a lot of what we do. Uh, so that CAR, uh, that CAR ac acronym is very helpful if it, if it is the first time that you've heard about this and you do want to remember it. I'd like you to take a moment to think about a time you had high wellbeing. Or was it a time shared with people that you cared about? Was it a time you had choice in? Was it a time when you felt competent in some way? Perhaps you can see aspects of CAR in your times of high wellbeing. It's also useful to think of wellbeing as different but related to mental illness. Corey Key's dual continuum model illustrates this well. This model is useful in understanding the relationship between well-being and mental illness. So it shows that a person can live with mental illness and have either high well-being and be flourishing or have low well-being and be languishing. Similarly, a person can have no mental illness and can have either high well-being and be flourishing or low well-being and be languishing. Wellbeing has the potential to be useful and valuable to everybody. Uh, now, as a forewarning, in this slide, I am going to talk about mental illness as well as uh, wellbeing. Uh, I do refer to suicide rates, so please use your own judgment and self-care in determining if you wish to, wish to listen to this part of the presentation or not. We've established that mental illness and well-being are different from each other. However, they are related and well-being can be used to protect ourselves and our children. In Australia, we have a considerable mental illness, including among our young people. Suicide is the leading cause of death for our young people in Australia. Uh, and two in five Australians aged 16 to 85 experience uh, mental disorder at some time in their lives. And over 75% of mental illness issues occur before the age of 25. What we know about wellbeing is that it has the potential to protect and prevent some mental illness in some circumstances. So wellbeing has the potential to enhance the quality of life um, also for people living with mental illness. 
Uh, at the conference that I recently attended in Canada, we looked at some of the research done in the US for the MIDAS study. And the MIDAS study is a national longitudinal study of health and well-being in America involving thousands of participants. And this data shows the clear relationship between well-being, psychological health, uh, physiological health, and even longevity in life. Building the vocabulary, the knowledge and the skills about and for well-being therefore makes sense and could help our communities live healthier, happier and longer lives. For anyone who needs support services at any time, I just have those listed there also. Now, if we have communities that facilitate and enable well-being, then the people within those communities are more likely to flourish. When we talk about community, we're talking about a group or a group of people who are united in some way, so perhaps by their geographical location, common interests, common social groups, common nationality, for, for instance, or a school community. Community well-being is the well-being of that united group. But more than that, community wellbeing is considered possibly greater than the sum of the parts. There can be synergy and upswell in wellbeing through the interconnectedness and community cohesion through community belonging uh, and shared values. Today, today, I'll briefly touch on some parts of community. I'll be talking a little bit about family, workplaces and sports clubs. Of course, community is more than these, but we just don't have time enough to dive deeper today or go broader. Uh, once I've talked a little about those aspects of community, I'll then give some examples of community cohesion, where the parts mm -hmm. of community come together sharing values, sharing language about and for wellbeing, and creating that synergistic upswell of wellbeing through com community cohesion. Okay, so parenting in communities of wellbeing. Parenting in these types of wellbeing, uh, these types of community, uh, is parenting that is a strengths based and strengths focused. Youth are viewed as being full of potential. We know that parents who help uh, children recognize, express, and regulate their emotions help children grow into more emotionally and socially competent adolescents and adults. Uh, and supportive behaviours include reflecting feelings, guiding problem solving, encouraging uh, emotion expression, modelling helpful emotion regulation. Uh, and positive parenting behaviours include that, those that are warm and supportive with minimal use of hostile, co coercive or rejecting behaviours. These positive behaviours are associated with fewer internalising problems, such as anxiety and depression, uh, where, and they're also associated with more pro-social uh, child behaviours and less aggression. And I have a slide here. There are just a few uh, resources that I've picked out that might be of interest to you. So we've got the Triple Parenting, uh, Triple P Positive Parenting Program is an excellent population approach to promoting positive parenting. It builds parenting knowledge and skills and importantly also builds supportive environments around parents. I also have a couple of links to some uh, readings there for those who are curious to read a little bit more. And another useful resource source is The Strengths Switch there. That's a book by Dr. Lee Waters who uh, uh, is an honorary fellow at our Centre for Wellbeing Science. In terms of education, if you're an educator or you care about the education of our young people, we probably share the knowledge that wellbeing matters in an educational context. Wellbeing is related to student identity, uh, self-efficacy, belonging, school attendance, school engagement, academic performance and positive academic trajectories. Wellbeing is important from preschool through primary and secondary school and into vocational training and higher education. Importantly, wellbeing at key transition points is particularly, particularly pertinent and relates to student decisions about staying or leaving education and about engaging or not. And we know education is predicted by and predictive of socioeconomic outcomes. 
Keeping our kids present, engaged and active in their education helps to set them up for success in life. We can do this through a strengths-based approach that views students as being full of potential and where positive educational approaches are supported and enacted throughout the education system. Again, another resource slide for you, a few handy resources to start exploring if you're curious. Uh, I have here a link for the Positive Education Schools Australia website, PISA. I also have listed a few books here that might be of interest to you. The first three listed there, I actually have chapters written in, collaborative chapters uh, about wellbeing literacy. Uh, the first one, the Palgrave Handbook in Positive Education is an open access book and it's free to download the whole book. Uh, and the final book shown here is about developing wellbeing policy in schools. All right, so when we turn our minds to sports and coaching in sports, how people choose to coach, that coaching approach influences well-being and also performance. A coaching approach that nurtures trusting, caring relationships is important and a coaching approach that promotes high quality motivation is most effective at supporting both well-being and performance. When I talk about high quality motivation, I'm talking about motivation that is highly needs supportive, that supports those basic psychological needs I spoke of earlier on, of competence, autonomy and relatedness. Now, a beautiful example of a coaching approach with high quality motivation is that by Ash Barty's mindset coach, Ben Crow. Unfortunately, we can't share this video today due to streaming limitations, but I would strongly recommend that you watch this in your own time. It's about an eight minute video where Lee Sales interviews Ben. During the interview, we hear beautiful examples of how Ash's motivation and performance are linked to her personal values. We hear about her authentic, inherent love of tennis. We hear about her enjoyment of the journey, her connection to her family and team, how she says we, not I. Uh, we see evidence of making choices that are values aligned and volitional. Uh, we see evidence of growth and building competence, and we see evidence of high quality, nurturing, caring relationships. <clears throat> so what about workplaces then? In workplaces, well-being and high quality motivation are important as well. High well-being is associated with less employee absenteeism. Uh, less presenteeism, less sick leave, less burnout, uh, higher performance. In contrast, well-being, uh, poor well-being is associated with uh, increased employee absenteeism, increased sick leave, uh, burnout and lower performance. We see evidence for this in Gallup's Global Workplace Wellbeing Report and various other reports and measures globally and locally. The good news is that we can create more well work workplaces and one way we can do this is by building capability among our leaders. Positive leadership can be taught uh, and, for example, positive leadership recognises strengths, capacity and capability, provides opportunity to grow building capability, allows for choices and independent decisions where it's safe and reasonable. Uh, and it nurtures high quality, trusting relationships. So I've spoken a bit about high quality motivation in these last uh, couple of slides, and I'd like to just share this slide with you uh, that illustrates that continuum of motivation. So this slide was kindly created by my colleague, Dr. Lara Mossman, and we see that motivation can be non-existent with no, no motivation, simply not interested and then we have a continuum of motivation moving along here so rather than thinking about motivation as either being present or not which is often how people might think about motivation we see here this continuum of motivation so it can begin at the very end there in the a motivation section simply not interested then we step into these extrinsic or external forms of motivation starting with reward and punishment 
pride and we move into then the pride and guilt part of the continuum. We move into value, identity, and finally into uh, finally into this enjoyment and interest zone, that internal motivation uh, section, which is the highest quality of motivation. It's important to say that not all external motivation is bad and sometimes we need a little chilly on top to get us started and we may move through those different types of motivation in relation to a particular task or activity or even in one in one day we may move into different sections of that that motivation continuum. I can give the example of that 45 kilometer coast trek walk that I shared with you earlier on in the presentation today. I recognize in myself different elements of the motivation uh, in myself along the training journey. At times I train because I would feel guilty if I left my walking mates down and so I trained. Or I would train because I valued being fit and healthy. At other times I was thinking of myself as a fit and healthy person who valued having a fit and strong body, who valued connection with my friends and also valued connection with higher group. Uh, with a wider group, so partaking in the event in that way. And by the final day, there, uh, there were still elements of these extrinsic motivators, but there was also enjoyment. It was a really beautiful day and I did love it. So you can see how these different types of motivation can be present in life, in school, in sport and in work. And the ideal scenario is for our goal to be more in that intrinsic motivation space or more towards the intrinsic motivation space in the things that we do. Okay, so a key enabler to enhancing well-being in family, school, sport and work contexts is through wellbeing literacy. So wellbeing literacy is a key enabler for wellbeing and involves communicating about and for wellbeing. Already today, we've been talking about how we define wellbeing. We've talked about our basic psychological needs of competence, autonomy and relatedness. And we've talked about how wellbeing is different from but related to mental illness. We've been using the vocabulary about wellbeing and talking about the knowledge and the skills needed for parenting and teaching and coaching and working for wellbeing. So the wellbeing literacy model underpins how we define and measure wellbeing literacy. Wellbeing literacy involves intentionally communicating either about wellbeing or for wellbeing for yourself or for other people. The wellbeing literacy model is a capability model a capability is realised when skill and the opportunity to demonstrate or use that skill come together. Uh, and the wellbeing literacy model includes five dimensions, and these include the vocabulary, skills and knowledge about wellbeing, the capability of being sensitive and adaptive to context, the capability of intentionally intentionality, so intentionally communicating for or about wellbeing, comprehending about well-being and composing about well-being. And you'll notice that the comprehending and composing language use skills are multimodal and include reading, writing, listening, speaking, viewing and creating. Wellbeing literacy was first conceptualised and shared in a paper by Lindsay Odes and Alexandra Johnson in 2017. And since then, considerable work has been undertaken to better understand the model, including how we conceptualise wellbeing literacy, how we can measure it and how, we, how it might be operationalised. Now you can see some of our work there on the screen. To build a community of well-being where well-being is greater than the sum of the, in, of the individual people and the organisations within the community, then it's useful to consider building well-being literacy within that community. Sharing the vocabulary, the knowledge and the skills of well-being provides an opportunity to come together with shared values, to create a synergy and upswell together, building more community interconnection, cohesion and belonging. Some examples of projects that have supported community cohesion demonstrated this upswell and supported youth wellbeing. 
uh, the Marinda Council Positive Education Project, and also the online organisation, the Highway Foundation, and I'll share these briefly with you now. So here is one example uh, of a community who was working together. It's the Marinda Council Positive Education Project. Uh, this was a collaboration between schools and council and the wider community to build a positive, uh, positive education culture into their schools. Uh, it was also in collaboration with the Centre for Wellbeing Science. The project involved planning ahead uh, for implementation. Uh, it began with establishing um, common values and goals and continuous communication about and for wellbeing uh, occurred throughout the process. The process required buy-in by partners keen to be involved uh, and a common language in relation to the models of well-being, uh, leadership, implementation and measurement was necessary throughout the process. Another community of cohesion and well-being is the online community of the Highway Foundation. The Highway Foundation <laughs> getting tongue, a tongue, tongue tie there. The Highway Foundation is another community-based organisation that fosters youth connection. It's a modern day youth group. The directors of the Highway Foundation are experts in wellbeing. Dr. Tan Chuen Chin is an honorary fellow at the centre from the Centre for Wellbeing Science. Uh, she was also my supervisor, my co-supervisor for my PhD. Uh, and um, uh, Tan Chuen Chin is also an, inter it was inter an integral part in the Marinda Council project as well. Uh, Layla McGregor also works with the Highway Foundation and is a graduate of the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology. The Highway Foundation explains on their website, when you have a strong sense of who you are, you are more likely to find your direction and feel confident to take the right steps to move forward in your life. At Highway, we promote optimal functioning and mental health by fostering a stronger sense of authentic self, self-determined purpose, meaningful engagement and connections. We help young people connect to themselves with others and the world by inspiring hope and confidence in an uncertain future beyond loneliness. Highway provides safe, confidential and free programs to support young people to gain confidence, to take action and alleviate distress from loneliness and social isolation. Highway Foundation welcomes uh, young people from all ethnicities, genders and backgrounds, and we're an inclusive youth, youth charity with no re religious affiliations. We are forging a new path in youth health and wellbeing. So how do we prepare our young people for wellbeing? Uh, the recommendations that I will leave you with today would be to find out what our shared values and dreams are. The values uh, and dreams of our young people and the communities that they are part of. To see the amazing potential and strengths of our youth and build upon those strengths to help them realise their potential. Uh, to find opportunities for community collaboration to create that synergy and upswell for wellbeing. To communicate in ways that support wellbeing, both uh, communicating both about and for wellbeing. Uh, using wellbeing literacy, and to build more calm, competence, autonomy and relatedness for ourselves and others, uh, trying to bring that into the live, into all of our lives. So if you're curious to learn more, to stay in touch, then jump onto our CWS ULM website. I have uh, here our annual review. I've also, if you're curious to study with us, there's a link here to find out more about study. We do uh, Masters of Applied Positive Psychology and also Professional Certificates in Positive Education and Wellbeing Science and various other courses. If you're interested in collaborating, reach out and contact me. That would be great. Uh, and I think that might be about it for now. So I will stop sharing if I can work out where to do that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, very, oh, awesome. very insightful. You've covered a lot of ground there. Um, so people might have questions or want more information about, um, yeah, particular, um, particular aspects. We did get some questions um, when people registered, so I might just draw on some of those if that's okay. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so you've mentioned some examples um, and most of those seem to be around teenagers. What about primary age kids? Do you have any um, examples of wellbeing projects with, um, you know, 8 to 11 year olds sort of? Yeah, it's a good question. There's actually, there's limited amount of research done in that space, but I actually did work in that space for my PhD. So I created a, a, a pilot program. Um, I actually co-developed it with um, teachers and students. It was a collaborative process, finding out what teachers and students uh, valued and what was useful and helpful for them in their spaces within the wellbeing science space. Uh, and put together a, a brief online program. So teachers are really keen in general to be uh, bringing wellbeing into their classrooms. Uh, the program that I developed was a brief online one. So that was, that I think was quite well re received in that it was a resource that was there that teachers could dip into and use um, and in, in ways that were meaningful to them in their context, in their class, and it was teacher delivered. So teachers were, were able to contextualize the program. So that's one example. Um, and there are more, there are resources around that, that, um, that are available for, for teachers to use in classrooms. So Smiling Minds is actually a, a nice resource if you're just wanting to do that one-off um, lesson in your class, for example. Um, but of course, we know that uh, if you're teaching wellbeing in the class, it's going to be more effective if you're doing it in a holistic way. So if you're doing it in a way where um, the where there's that shared language across the school, where everybody's on board, where the parents understand what you're talking about, where the, the leadership in the school is supportive of it, the teachers in the classroom feel like that's something meaningful and works for them. Uh, and so that something that you might be able to achieve more effectively if you have policy around that. So there was a resource that I shared a month, uh, in one of those slides as well. If, you, if you're thinking about how you might write policy or create that policy for your school that really, I guess, enables and supports those kinds of activities and lessons in your school, um, that might be handy for people as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's also a question here about... Um, the role that perhaps animals can play, pets and, and so forth. Can you make any comments? The question is specifically about dogs, but I think people have lots of different kinds of pets that might play a role in wellbeing. Yeah, look, I think that there's there's a bit of research out there, particularly dogs is the thing that comes to mind, actually, and I think that it can really be helpful in uh, harming people. So having having dogs as part of their lives or pets as part of their lives can be a very calming experience. And there are some organisations. So we have one of our graduates and one of our alumni from the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology, Ros Rhymes has um, Zest for Life, I think her organisation is, and she has her dogs that she takes places. They're trained uh, and they're, they're wellbeing dogs. She takes them into spaces. I know she's taken them into hospitals um, in Melbourne uh, for the staff and, uh, and she brings them into the university at times and it is just that really calming experience and I think it is a co-regulation strategy, a, a, an emotion regulation um, approach for some students. I've been to schools that have have dogs permanently at the school or might have people who have trained dogs that they'll bring in regularly for the school. Um, there's one particular school that was um, a, a lower socioeconomic school in Melbourne, quite a number of children um, having trauma, trauma, trauma in their past and uh, they really loved that dog coming into school and it was one of the strategies that they used for some of the students who were having more trouble engaging with and attending school and having that the dog in there, that trained dog, was a really helpful um, strategy for them to be able to bring the kids into the school and to have the kids feel like they wanted to be there. Okay. That leads on to another question around working with children in out-of-home care. And how might wellbeing outcomes need to be adapted for this cohort? Yeah, you know, I think when we're thinking about um, student or, or children in that cohort, I think it's really important to be thinking through a trauma-informed lens uh, because 
often they they that's the context for them uh, and there are some really useful um, it, there is some really useful research and information around trauma informed approaches to positive psychology or well being. Berry Street is actually a really great place to learn about that or um, to see what they do. Uh, Tom Brunzel is one of the Masters of Applied Positive Psychology uh, alumni. He works with Berry Street and he does he, he has in his research looked at trauma informed approaches uh, to working with um, working with young people. Uh, so that's certainly some research uh, that I'd uh, encourage looking at if you're interested in that in that space. In terms of thinking about adapting outcomes, I think that we're all in, on different places on that well-being. If you think about well-being as being a continuum from really low or no well-being to really high and flourishing, we all sit along that continuum somewhere. And so for any of us, I guess if we're thinking about improving our well-being, we need to think about what our context is, where we sit along it, where we need, where we would like to move next. So some of us might be down low. We just want to move a little bit along here. We might still not be hugely flat. We might not be flourishing yet, but we're still moving in that positive direction. So I think being realistic um, at, about where we are and where we need to go is important and thinking about the context of, of context of where we sit as well and sometimes yeah. we have setbacks and absolutely you know, that's life need to tune up and... yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah okay um i was wondering if you could comment um i'm sure you get this question a lot but about the impact of covid has that had a substantial impact on our well-being or is it just people are talking about it more now no, I think the evidence is 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 broadly, of course, not for everybody. Some for some people, that COVID experience was not such a negative thing. But I think broadly, um, it it has had impact, uh, and that's locally and globally. So globally, we have children who've really slipped into um, slipped out of education because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, here, I think similarly, we've had had children who have slipped in terms of engagement, um, who have lost ground in education, in the educational milestones, I guess, uh, and, and I guess in, in wellbeing in general, I think the pandemic overall was, um, was, was detrimental in some way. But then I guess we're also thinking that there's, we know that we can improve and we can we can do better and move in the right direction. But I don't think that it was helpful. And I do think that their overall has had a negative impact. Mm. Yeah. More for kids or adults, do you think? Or I wouldn't, I, or I don't depends, know about yeah. more. It would be hard yeah. for me to say without diving into yes. literature, but I would say both. And I think that we see that in 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 the great resignation. Um, quiet resignation, whatever you would like, however you'd like to, whatever you'd like to call it. But I think that we see it in the um, burnout, the high burnout rates in a lot of our service sectors. So our in our education sector, in nursing, um, I think the pandemic has had a really massive effect on adults as well as children. Mm. Yeah. And of course, if it's affecting our adults, it's going to be affecting our children. They know what we're thinking and feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And someone's asked, you know, just for a bit more detail around co-creating and piloting, I think setting up a new project, you know, in a new community or with a new organisation. Do you want to draw on your experiences to tell us a bit more about how you've done that? Yeah, absolutely. I Most recently I worked with Richmond Fellowship Queensland, which I think we've spoke, we, we mentioned briefly in the beginning, and that was a project of creating a wellbeing literacy program for the uh, for a, an indigenous community um, in Queensland, and we really wanted it to be uh, fit for purpose, and so really needed that critical review of what was needed for that program. And so, I worked with the Richmond Fellowship Queensland Indigenous team, their First Nations team, also an Indigenous expert at the University of Melbourne, uh, and gave a program that had been written for uh, Richmond Fellowship Queensland previously and asked them to critique that. Um, and so basically just stripped it apart and said, uh, didn't tell me all of the things that didn't 
work, which was quite a lot of it. And so basically did a ground up build again from there based on the feedback that came through. So really using the wellbeing literacy model. In that case, I was needing to use the um, Indigenous social and emotional wellbeing framework for wellbeing. So really grounding it in uh, First Nations conceptualizations of wellbeing and then bringing the wellbeing literacy framework into that. And uh, because it was for First Nations people, that particular project um, really uplifting First Nations voices. So get, providing examples through First Nations stories, through podcasts and videos that were by uh, First Nations people about First Nations stories. So really um, highlighting the voice of the people that you're working with, I think is very important and hearing I think the deep listening actually, listening to what people actually need and want and then and and then creating what you think you hear and then asking back, is that is that is that right? Is that what you needed? So it's really that open communication and the dialogue and the trusting relationships that we have with each other as well, very important. So I guess the, the co-creation might look different in different contexts and depending on who you might be working with. And I've done other projects that have been different to that. But I think that open communication and the listening is probably, and the trust are probably some key themes that run through any all of those projects. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a question here about um, sort of government response to this. You know, are governments engaging with wellbeing work and projects? Are they interested? Are they funding them? Yeah, yeah, I think actually it's a hot topic at the moment, and they are more inter getting increasingly more interested. Um, because of that relationship between well-being and mental uh, mental health, but also also people are starting to really understand the significant impact that well-being has in workplaces and and on the bottom line economically as well. So, for instance, the con conference that I was just in, in in Canada recently, I was hearing about how some uh, organisations really want to know who are or some uh, people who are investing in the stock market are really wanting to know which organisations have high levels of well-being so that they have a better understanding of which organisations are likely to be high performers who are likely to be a better bet for in a stock market situation. So people are really starting to understand the value in fiscal terms as well as just in terms of human terms. So governments are getting on board. Um, there is there is money and there is interest. Um, most recently I was involved in the Department of Education New South Wales refresh, bringing uh, wellbeing literacy into um, their framework for schools. And, and I know there's work being done at um, a federal level to think about what might be happening in terms of how we look at wellbeing, what we measure for wellbeing, these kinds of things, and what's going on across different across states. So it's something of, of interest. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so as a resident um, of the Golden Valley, yes. what do you think in terms of wellbeing that we do well and what recommendations might you have for um I'm sure there's schools people from schools local government um and a whole range of services listening in so ah oh, I've, I've had a little insight into some of the schools here and I just love the enthusiasm and the the authenticity and the love that people have for the students and the general the 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 genuine care that that schools have for their students so I do think that there is a lot that's going on real that that's really exciting and that is being done really well um I think examples of that might be uh, great food programs at some of the primary schools so kids are actually getting fed before they're starting school I mean that's pretty fundamental to actually have something to eat before you start to try and think for the day um I know some of the schools have some great music programs. So the idea of bringing arts into the schools and that opportunity for students to really be able to flourish in different ways. You know, we don't all, we're not all necessarily going to be um, amazing writers or amazing mathematicians, but to have that opportunity to flourish in a different way, to be able to show your whole self, to, to dive into the arts or to, to dive into it, to be part of a sport or a camping trip, this multi-dimensional sort of aspects of who we are, having that opportunity to do those different things. I see lots of opportunities to, to, to grow and to do even better with those kinds of things. Um, 
Uh, I know that there are lots of organisations within the Goulburn Valley who work really hard to, to support the people of the Goulburn Valley, and that's so exciting to see that. I wonder whether there's opportunity for us to connect better in a collaborative sense. I think this is true of the world. We often work in our own space um, and we forget that there's someone beside us who has the same goals and the same values as us, and we could perhaps join join together and do even better together. So I wonder whether there's opportunity for that in this yeah. space. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I'm also thinking about some of the, you know, outdoor activities, you know, activities in the park and park run and um, some of those things that I think connect people um, but yes. also provide that physical activity yeah well exactly known. yeah exactly thinking about the whole person how we're we eating well how we're we sleeping well how we're we moving well and how we then thinking also about our our well-being other com com aspects of our well-being and in particular relationships I think if we were to bring it down to one thing that we really needed to think about and really needed to do well with it's those relationships how can we create those connections and relationships with people how can we uh, give people an opportunity to th to show the best of themselves and be the best of themselves in some way. Um, I think that that would be really wonderful. I'm really excited about Sam, the gallery. Yeah. I, yeah, I feel like there's lots of opportunity for uh, connection there to bring community connection in or connect through Sam for community as well. So that's another space that might be exciting to see what happens in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think for many areas of, of Shepparton, it um, is a very family friendly community. Um, yeah, I think so. Know, and I think as you, yeah, I think as you were saying, Lisa, some of those uh, activities that happen, the park run or the the it's it's not what the light night. I can't think of the yeah. term. Yeah. Special lights. That was that's great. You know those occasions where we can get together and celebrate being together and I think those those occasions really bring community together and are great opportunities yeah and if anyone wants to list any in the um in the Q&A you're welcome to list those and share those activities to encourage people to to come along um so in terms of measuring well-being how good are we at measuring um well-being like we talk about it well-being being lower post-COVID, um, how good are those measurements? So they're good measurements. I guess it depends on what you're looking for and what you're understanding from those measures. So as long as you're understanding what people are talking about when we're talking about measures of wellbeing. So quite a few of the measures that we might be hearing about so if we're thinking about the well-being of a country, we might be hearing about life satisfaction. So it might be just one um, global impression of well-being that people have. So they're giving that subjective personal view of what their well-being is, and that's that measure. And then you're comparing that measure across countries. Um, and there's value in that, but as long as you understand that it, that's what it's measuring, whereas you might be getting more nuanced measures of well-being that are more suitable to certain contexts. So you might be looking at measures of meaning or you might be looking at measures uh, that relate to sub, uh, hedonic types of wellbeing. So that sort of happiness, positive and negative affect. Uh, you might be looking at more eudaimonic parts of wellbeing. So thinking about meaning and purpose. Um, and it might it will depend on what you're doing the measures for, uh, what you're wanting to find out, what you're hoping to achieve down the track as to which types of measures you're using um, and, and then what you're understanding from the measurement that you're doing. So I guess as long as you're understanding what you're doing and you're choosing measures that have been validated and are reliable, and there are plenty out there that have a lot of good, solid research behind them that support um, that they are useful and good measures. Uh, in terms of wellbeing literacy, there is the Wellit 6. So we do have a wellbeing literacy scale that has been validated and measured in um, Australian and Chinese populations. Uh, so it's just really a matter of checking in and looking at what it is um, that you want to measure and checking that you've got a scale that's actually doing what you're, what you're hoping that it'll do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And one final question. Um, any? Examples of how to get parents and teachers 
to work together um, on wellbeing initiatives? Have you mm. found that a challenge or that's flowed relatively well? I think parents are often left out of the equation, to be honest. I think often um, often it's the school schools, um, staff and students, often the focus of students, teachers are starting to become more into the into the consideration of things which of course they should be and I think our ne the next step is to try to bring parents into it. The Maroondah Council example that I gave through the presentation is one example of where they did collaboratively get uh, teachers, get the whole school community uh, on board in terms of having a, having a shared goal, having a shared plan about what they wanted to do in terms of wellbeing. Um, so I think there's huge value in trying to create that collaboration and perhaps it starts with a, a conversation about what it is, where we are, what it is, we, where we, where would we like to go next and trying to start that conversation early on and have it be a collaborative conversation rather than necessarily an Im imposed plan that occurs at some point in time. So I think when we get people on board with plans um, early on, we're more likely to get buy-in and collaboration. Well, Jackie, thank you very much for sharing your insights and your um, experiences and to hear about your research has just been terrific. Um, sounds like wonderful research to do and um, I'd love to hear more sometime. But thanks so much for sharing tonight and um, yes, we really appreciate the effort that you've put into your presentation. Um, thanks also to everyone for coming, for those who submitted questions, who had comments on the Padlet. Um, it's great to see people engaged. Thank you very much for your attendance and I look forward to um, our next public webinar. Good night.